Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the National Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes. To keep in touch with us, use our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, which are all at Q and Review. That's C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. Or get in touch via information at qandreview.com. That's information at C U E A N D R E V I E W dot com. Please like and share our podcast and give us any constructive feedback. From the National, Friday the 4th of March 2022, from the politics section. Former Orange Order Chief Henry Dunbar stands for Scottish Labour in local elections. By Gregor Young, the former Orange Order global leader has been confirmed as a candidate for Scottish Labour in the upcoming local elections. As the party attempts to rival the Scottish Tories in a bid for support from unionists, Henry Dunbar, who was Imperial Grand President and Grand Master of the Grand Orange Lodge of Scotland, has been chosen as a candidate for the North Lanarkshire Council. The council is currently run by a minority Labour administration. The SNP accused the party of working with the ex-leader of a deeply divisive organisation. Dunbar was involved in organising Scotland's biggest anti-independence event ahead of the 2014 referendum, in which 15,000 people marched in Edinburgh ahead of the vote. In a Channel 4 news report of the march, Dunbar was seen telling crowds, Mr Salmond, you will not con the loyal Protestant people of Scotland. No to independence and no surrender to separatism. Dunbar, 66, is one of two Labour candidates in the four-member Adrian North Ward, where the party already has one councillor. In the neighbouring Airdrie South, Scottish Labour is represented by councillor Ian McNeil, an executive officer of the Orange Order in Scotland, for the last three years. Dunbar told the Herald that he supports the values of Labour, believing them to be equality and fairness, and likes Anna Sarwar and Keir Stammer. On whether his Orange George links would influence voters, Dunbar said, The Orange Order, as an institution, doesn't really get involved in politics. They don't tell their members what to vote, and I certainly wouldn't suggest to the members that they vote for me. They take me on my, my merit. I believe I can do a good job for the constituents of the Airdrie North area. If I'm fortunate to be elected for the Scottish Labour Party, all constituents will be the same to me. At the end of the day, I will support all the constituents. Nothing else comes into it. It's all about supporting the communities. I don't see why the Orange Order should come come into it. I'm not standing for the Orange Order. I'm standing for Scottish Labour. I'm a member of the Labour Party. I'm standing for the good of the constituents. I feel very passionate about that. I'm standing for these people and it doesn't matter to me what creed or religion or colour they are. I'll be standing 100% for every single one of them. A spokesperson for Scottish Labour said all their candidates have pledged to reflect and uphold the party's aims and values as a tolerant, open and democratic party and that Dunbar will be held to this same high standard. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for the SNP said Anne Sarwar claims to promote tolerance in politics but in desperation for council candidates, Scottish Labour has opened its doors to the ex-leader of a deeply divisive organisation. Only the SNP has the positive vision to take Scotland forward. That's why on 5th of May, there has to be a vote for the SNP. And that piece was by Gregor Young. From the National, Friday the 4th of March 2022. From the news section, Ukraine invasion. Zelensky asked Putin for one-on-one talks to de-escalate war. By Beth Whitelaw, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has asked Russian President Vladimir Putin for one-on-one talks as Russia forces battle for control of a crucial energy-producing city in Ukraine's south and gaining ground in a bid to cut off the country from the sea. Ukrainian leaders, meanwhile, are calling on citizens to rise up and wage guerrilla war against the invaders. The fighting continued at Enerohodar, a city on the Dnieper River that accounts for about one quarter of the country's power generation, as around another round of talks between the two sides began. The talks yielded what Ukraine said was tentative agreement with Russia to set up safe corridors inside the country for evacuating citizens and delivering aid. The mayor of Enerhodar, 
the site of Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, said forces were battling Russian troops on the city's outskirts and urged residents not to leave their homes. Moscow's advance on Ukraine's capital in the north has apparently stalled over the past few days, with a huge armoured column outside Kiev at a standstill. This is in part due to the stiffer-than-expected resistance from Ukrainians, which has staved off the swift victory that Russia will have hoped for. But the Russian forces have been launching missile and artillery attacks on civilian areas and making significant gains in the south as part of an effort to sever the country's connection to the Black and Azov seas. Cutting Ukraine's access to the coastline would deal a crippling blow to the country's economy and allow Russia to build a land corridor stretching from its border across Crimea, which has been occupied by Russia since 2014, west all the way to Romania. Officials have also announced that the Russian forces have taken over Kherson as the local government's headquarters there were captured. The vital Black Sea port town with a population of 280,000 people is the first major city to fall since the invasion began a week ago. Heavy fighting continues on the outskirts of another strategic port, Mariupol, on the Azov Sea, with electricity and phone service largely down. Meanwhile, a second round of talks between Ukrainian and Russian delegations were concluded in neighbouring Belarus. Vladimir Medinsky, Putin's advisor, who led the Russian delegation on the talks in Belarus, said the parties' positions are absolutely clear, they are written down point by point, including issues related to a political settlement of the conflict. He added, without elaboration, that mutual understanding was found in part of them. Both parties confirmed a third round of talks would be held soon. French President Emmanuel Macron tweeted that he'd spoken with the Putin yesterday morning. He refuses to stop his attacks on Ukraine at this point. It is vital to maintain dialogue to avoid human tragedy. I will continue my efforts and contacts. We must avoid the worst. Putin said he was determined to press on with his attack until the end, according to an official in the French President's office. Putin also said accusations that his military had attacked residential areas were part of an, an anti-Russian disinformation campaign and insisted that Russia uses only precision weapons to exclusively destroy military infrastructure. Zelensky said that Russian land forces have been stalled and Moscow is now unleashing air attacks, but that they have been parried by Ukrainian defence systems, including in Kherson. Zelensky also called for Putin to meet him. Sit down with me to negotiate, not just at 30 metres, he said at a news conference. I don't bite. What are you afraid of? He said it would be sensible to have talks, adding, any words are more important than shots. He also said the world was too slow to offer support and continued to prod Western leaders to enforce a new flow fly zone over Ukraine. The US and NATO allies have ruled out the move, which would see Western militaries pitted directly against Russian forces. Zelensky said if the West remains reluctant to declare a no-fly zone, it should at least provide Kiev with fighter jets. The UN Refugee Agency says one million people have fled Ukraine since the invasion in the swiftest exodus of refugees this century. At least 227 civilians have been killed and 525 wounded in that time, according to the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, though they said it was an undercount and could not be officially verified. And that was a piece by Beth Whitelaw. From The National, Friday the 4th of March 2022, from the comments section. Why UK absolutely must open doors to more refugees from Ukraine? By columnist Joanna Cherry. For a brief moment at PMQs this week, Boris Johnson told the truth when a Labour MP challenged him on the UK's inability to guarantee the territorial integrity of Ukraine. While stressing that nobody wants war, Chris Bryant made a fair point by drawing a contrast between the energy and sacrifice expended when Belgium and Poland were similarly invaded in the first half of the 20th century. The PM replied that the stark reality is that no country in the West is going to afford the Ukrainians direct military assistance because the consequences of a direct confrontation between Western countries and Russia would not be easy to control. Everyone in the chamber knew what he meant. Despite the spontaneous outpouring of support for the Ukrainian ambassador in the gallery above us, people are rightly terrified of an escalated conflict and the threat of nuclear war. 
Chris Bryant urged Swift in a more exacting enforcement of sanctions, and he was right to do so. The other thing the UK must do is give much more to help the soon-to-be millions of people displaced by Russia's war of aggression. Yesterday, the UN reported that already 1 million people have fled Ukraine. This is predicted to increase to 4 million. In the face of those figures, what the UK has promised so far is woefully inadequate. And it wasn't long before Boris was back to telling porkies again, when he claimed that the UK had taken more vulnerable people fleeing theatres of conflict since 2015 than any other country in Europe. This is simply not true. Germany took in more in a single year in 2019, 70,000, than the UK did in six from 2015 to 2020, 66,000. So let's stop with the lies and the hyperbole about Britain's proud record. The consequences of the conflict in Ukraine could dwarf any refugee crisis Europe has seen since the Second World War. For the UK to play a proper part in tackling the issue, it will take a sea change in Tory policies. As the expert immigration lawyer Colin Yeo said earlier this week, UK refugee policy is not just woefully inadequate for the scale of this particular crisis, it is also isolationist and cruel. That cruelty was exemplified in Junior Home Officer Minister Kevin Foster's tweet suggesting Ukrainian refugees could come to the UK if they were prepared to pick fruit. This arrogant fool should have got the sack for his comment, but the truth is he takes his lead from his boss, Priti Patel, who was at her snarling worst when the SNP's refugee and asylum policy expert, Stuart MacDonald, took her inadequate plans apart in the Commons this week. What's really needed is to get rid of Priti and her and co, clear up what's gone before and is still a pragmatic humanist in the Home Office. Maybe David Davis? Unlikely, but he was one of a group of senior Tories who wrote to Boris Johnson warning that the policy underlying the anti-refugee nationality and borders bill is dangerous and would see the UK significantly breach key international obligations. The senior Tories were joined by a thousand faith leaders representing the six major faiths across the UK who begged the PM not to close the door on refugees. The crisis in Ukraine shows that the UK government must change course and more and more people are realising that. While many, including the Scottish Refugee Council, graciously welcome Patel's relaxation of visa requirements for the extended family members of Ukrainians living in the UK and a new sponsorship programme, they are right to say these measures don't go nearly far enough. As my fellow SNP MP Stuart MacDonald argued in the House of Commons this week, the UK needs to emulate the EU by waiving visa requirements for Ukrainians. This would do away with the sort of red tape that has seen the parents of one of my constituents, having escaped the fighting, stranded in a third country, while their paper visas for the UK sit in Lviv in the, in the visa application centre. Priti Patel has fallen back on unexplained security concerns to justify taking a different approach to our European neighbours. But, as Stuart also pointed out, when you think of the UK's open land border with the Republic of Ireland, which is taking a far more generous approach, this explanation doesn't really add up. And, while the humanitarian sponsorship pathway could be a welcome addition, such schemes are notoriously slow. Furthermore, there must not be a way for the UK government to shuffle its responsibilities off onto cash straps local authorities and community groups. The much maligned House of Lords realises big changes are needed. In a string of defeats for the UK government this week, their lordships have removed some of the most egregious parts of the Nationality Borders Bill, including the criminalisation of asylum seekers and plans for offshore processing. Peers also voted for amendments leading a path for unaccompanied children in Europe to be reunited with family in the UK when they claim asylum, for an annual refugee resettlement commitment of 10,000, and for a new safe route for people to have their claim for asylum in the UK received and considered overseas when under risk of genocide. And, in a huge victory for campaigners from Maryhill Integration, the Lords also voted to lift the ban on asylum seekers working. At the very least, these changes to the bill must be preserved when it returns to the Commons. It would be horrifying if, in the midst of the current crisis, the Commons was to pass legislation that would criminalise Ukrainians who arrive here seeking asylum outside the limited schemes announced by Priti Patel. Tory MPs have a moral responsibility to quell the moral panic 
about the number of asylum seekers crossing the channel to come to the UK. The evidence heard by the Joint Committee on Human Rights last year was that Greece, Italy and Spain have all received many such arrivals in recent years. The UN reports that in 2020, Italy had around 34,000 sea arrivals, Spain 40,000 and Greece 10,000, compared to the UK's 8,500. You don't need a visa to seek asylum, and asylum seekers must not be criminalised. But the focus must now be on creating a more safe, legal route, so that the UK's response to this humanitarian disaster goes some way to atone for our inability to stop it from happening. And that was a comment piece by Joanna Cherry. This article is from The National, date 7th March 2022, from the Culture section. Andrew Marr brands Vladimir Putin deranged on Good Morning Britain by the National News Desk. Andrew Marr has branded Vladimir Putin deranged but says he's one of the cleverest men that I have ever interviewed. The veteran broadcaster who left the BBC in November last year after 21 years grilled Putin in 2014 ahead of the Winter Olympics in Sochi. Reflecting on their meeting as he spoke ahead of the launch of his new LBC show, Marr told ITV's Good Morning Britain he was an extraordinary. He's got this very famous cold, cold stare that people talk about. But I would say, listening to him, because he was being interviewed then in lots of different languages, He's one of the cleverest men that I have ever interviewed. He may not be any more, but he was then. I was in a slightly disturbed state myself because I had just interviewed Elton John before I had gone out to Sochi in Russia. If you remember, there was a big gay rights issue at the Winter Olympics, suspicion that the Russians were homophobic. And Elton John said, oh, you're off to see Vladimir Putin. I said, yes. And Elton John said, well, give him a Donna Summer album and a kiss from me. And I thought, I can't really do that. But that was going round in my head as I was talking to Putin. So it was a real moment. He added, over the last 50 years, we have faced as a country, frankly, deranged foreign leaders or people whose mental stability we were unsure about. And we have faced nuclear threats. But what we haven't faced before is the two things coming together at once. That's why this is such a dangerous moment for us and for the world. Asked if he thinks Putin is hiding behind Russia's nuclear umbrella, Marr said, exactly. I think the concern here is that he hasn't got many other places to go. I think the economic stranglehold on the Russian economy is brutal and by all accounts highly effective. He's going to find it very, very hard to keep his country running. They're running out of money quite soon. People are going to be rioting in the streets about that. His war machine is not a very warlike war machine. They're very, very good at killing unarmed civilians. They don't seem to be quite so good at fighting. He's in real, real trouble than Kiev. So what else does he have left? Frankly, he's got nuclear weapons left. And that's why I think we're going to hear more and more blood curdling threats from him. And we're going to have to say, as we say in Scotland, keep the heat. Marr, who was formerly the political editor of the BBC, before going on to host Sunday morning politics programme, The Andrew Marr Show, left the broadcaster to focus on writing and presenting political and cultural shows for Global and writing for newspapers. He said his new show on LBC, which launches on Monday night, gives him a new freedom to do fast-paced, very regular political journalism with no filter. He blasted the government over its visa system for allowing Ukrainian refugees to enter the UK, telling Good Morning Britain hosts Susanna Reid and Richard Maidley, I am, I think, as angry as both of you seem to be about the lack of generosity and openness when we're bringing people into this country, refugees. 
all across Britain. People are raising money, they're collecting food, they're collecting clothing to send to the Ukrainians. There's a real sense that we stand with the Ukrainians. We want to help and welcome Ukrainians. That is the kind of people we are in this country. And to have such a meagre, infuriating visa system at this time, it seems to me that the Foreign Office and the Home Office have got a complete tin ear for the mood of the country. They really have to get a grip of this very soon indeed. That article was by the National News Desk. This article is from The National, date 7th March 2022, from the News section. Deanston Bakery. Ukrainian baker raises more than £25,000 in fundraiser. By Gregor Young. A fundraising sale organised by a Ukrainian baker to help those caught up in the conflict in his homeland has raised more than £25,000. Hundreds of people queued around the block to buy cakes, buns and other baked treats from the Deanston Bakery in the Shawlands area of Glasgow on Sunday. Yuri Kachak organised the fundraising initiative as he felt helpless when news of the Russian invasion unfolded and decided to use his skills to do what he could to help people affected. Some people queued for more than two hours on Sunday to buy treats, such as cinnamon buns from a selection of goods baked by Kachak and his team, alongside home bakes donated by local people. Raffle tickets with prizes donated by local businesses were also on sale and there was live music to entertain people as they waited. All proceeds raised on the day will go to help those affected by the war in Ukraine. The bakery team thanked everyone for their support in a post on Instagram on Sunday night, writing, So far, together we've raised £25,000. Thank you so much to everyone who has supported us this week and everyone who came along today. Earlier, they said, what a day. Thank you so much to every single person who came along to support the bake sale today and for all the messages of support. The posts drew praise on social media with comments including absolutely incredible. Just shows how important you guys are to our community and how we all stand with you. And so heartwarming to see such an amazing turnout. Kachak, who is from the ivano frankfist region in Western Ukraine, has lived in the UK for 19 years and moved to Scotland four years ago. He runs the popular Deanston Bakery with his wife Svetlana, who is from Latvia, and his mother and brother also work there. Speaking earlier in the week, Kachak had said, I felt a bit helpless when it all started, so I thought there's a lot of things I can't do, but this is a thing I can do. I can help people out. He added, all 100% of sales will be going to Ukraine. It's not about us as a business, it's about people getting together and raising funds to help those who need it. That article was by Gregor Young. From the National, Monday the 7th of March 2022, from the comment section, Maureen McGonagall, more must follow Australian Football League's lead against abuse, by sports columnist Maureen McGonagall. Hats off to the AFL, the Australian Football League, for taking a positive stance on body shaming from one of their players, Sarah Perkins, who was labelled as the league's first cult hero by ABC News was targeted. The trolls were out in force, hiding behind their keyboards and commenting on and criticising her appearance. Perkins called them out, but not everyone has the strength to do this, and they shouldn't have to. It's great that the AFL is not just paying lip service and brushing complaints under the carpet. It is confirmed it will take action and suspend the club or league memberships of any social media troll they can identify who has been found to have abused a player online. This invisible bullying can be difficult to call out, but it can, and this is a good start. Such actions can and do have an impact on the mental health of anyone unfortunate enough to become a target for them.
The hope it now is that other sports, not just in Australia, take the same strong line, that together we can make a change and that those who are in charge of the platforms also take a more stringent view of this type of harassment and bullying. This action from the AFL came about following consultation with both male and female players in a review. All aspects, including disability, appearance and sexuality, and will be covered under the AFL's verification rules. As we celebrate International Women's Day this week, it is sad to see that women in sport are still being judged on their appearance. What kind of message is this sending out to the young women who are keen to progress in their own particular sport? Be successful, but make a mistake and you will be vilified for all to see in social media. Hashtag Break the Bias is a theme for this year's International Women's Day and Scottish women in sport will celebrate this and help promote all the positive work that has been carried out in the name of sport. There is no doubt that the rules such as these of the AFL used in sport help to change a long established culture held within our society in general and help change the narrative and perception that women have to fit a certain stereotype in their looks no matter their sporting or academic achievements. And that was a comment piece by Maureen McGonagall. From the National, Monday the 7th of March 2022, from the comment section, Remember the names of women like Sabina Nessa and Sarah Everard, not their killers, by columnist Kirsty Strickland. The helplessness that grips us as we watch the rolling news coverage of Vladimir Putin's barbaric assault in Ukraine is not a new feeling. Whenever we are the horrified bystanders of tragic world events, it is always there. We look to our leaders to do something meaningful on our behalf. We are often left wanting. Grassroots activism and organising is one way that the public can demonstrate their anger or solidarity. While the world has rightly been preoccupied by the needless violence being inflicted on the people of Ukraine, last week we were reminded of the individual acts of brutality that we too often see in the streets and in homes across the UK. The one year anniversary of Sarah Everard's murder was marked with a remembrance event and renewed calls for more action to tackle men's violence against women. And, last Friday, the killer of Sabina Nessa admitted his guilt in court. When she was murdered in London last September, we felt a similar sense of helplessness. There was also anger at what was yet another example of a man deciding to play God with a woman's life. Vigils were organised and candles were lit in her memory. It wasn't enough. It never is. As with Sarah Everard, this was another woman lost to the scourge of male violence. The brutal violence Kochi Salamanj inflicted on Sabina Nessa was premeditated. He travelled to London from his home in Eastbourne with the sole intention of attacking a stranger. He lay in wait near a park before Sabina Nessa crossed his path. She was heading to meet a friend in a nearby pub. He saw to it she would never arrive. Salamanj struck her repeatedly over the head, dragged her unconscious body to a secluded area and then strangled her. In doing so, he robbed those who knew her of a much-loved family member and friend. But it was what he took from the 28-year-old herself that represented evil. He stole her future opportunities, achievements, and all the memories she had the right to assume she had ample time to make. She was a primary school teacher. Maybe she would have become one of those teachers that people remember fondly when they become adults. She might have been credited with instilling a passion for learning in her students or helping them through a difficult time. We will never know. All because one man decided to take the life of a stranger. For all the excuses and warped justifications we always hear when a man murders a woman, doing so is the ultimate act of control. Whether, as in this case, the woman is a stranger or as happens far more often, the victim is intimately known to the perpetrator. The decision to take the life of another is just that, 
a decision. His state of mind, insecurities, predilections or worries are secondary to that overriding belief that he is entitled to do as he pleases or for whatever reason he tells himself. That's why Sabina's murder and the premature death of all the other women relates to male violence every year provoke feelings of both helplessness and anger. It shouldn't be this way. Women should be able to walk home alone. They should be able to meet a friend in a pub or go for a run. They should also be able to do all the things that are viewed as risky or reckless only when a woman does them. Sometimes, when I write about the men's violence against women, I type women murdered or women attacked into Google and filter the news stories to show only those incidents which have been reported in the last week. I'm not suggesting you do the same. The results show that the worst of humanity and they highlight just how many horrifying acts of brutality never make it onto the front pages and into the public consciousness. They show the sheer scale of the problem of male violence against women. That familiar feeling of helplessness rises to the surface and you wonder how we ever have time to be angry about anything else when this horror is playing out every day across the UK. But, as the last few weeks have sadly reminded us, there's more than enough desperation and despair to go around. We can't, and we shouldn't, expect everybody to be in high alert to every action of injustice. Sometimes having a moment of quiet reflection is all we're able to do. When Sabine and Nessa was killed, Women's Aid tweeted, All women should be safe both in the streets and in their own homes. In solidarity and sisterhood, let's remember Sabina Nessa, another life lost to violence against women. Let's hashtag say Sabina Nessa's name so she gets the justice she deserves. Sabina Nessa's killer has admitted his guilt. It is right that it is her name we remember, not his. And that was a comment piece by Kirsty Strickland from The National. Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the news section, Alana Clark, teenager missing from Shettleson in Glasgow, article by Sarah Campbell, digital journalist. Concerns are growing for a teenage girl who is missing from Shettleson in Glasgow. Alana Clark, 14, was last seen at her home address around 10.30am on Monday, March the 7th. Her current whereabouts are unknown and her loved ones are becoming increasingly concerned for her. Alana is described as being white, 5 foot 4 inch in height, with red slash auburn hair. She was last seen wearing a black jacket, peach joggers and black trainers. Inspector Taylor from Shettleson Police Station said, Alana has been missing for a number of hours now. This is completely out of character for her and her family are understandably worried about it. We have a number of police resources looking out for Alana and I'm now looking for assistance from the public. The police are looking to trace Alana safe and well as quickly as possible. If you believe you've seen Alana or have any information, please contact 101 quoting incident number 1459 of the 7th of March 2022. And that was an article by Sarah Campbell. From the National, Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the news section, Glasgow City Council to give £110 gift cards in Scotland Loves Local Plan, article taken from the National News Desk. Millions of pounds worth of gift cards to be spent with Glasgow shops and businesses are to be given out to residents to help with Covid economic recovery. Glasgow City Council is planning to spend more than £9 million it received from the Scottish Government on giving out more than 80,000 cards worth £110 each. It is intended the gift cards, through the Scotland Loves Local campaign, will give a multi-million pound cash injection into the economy to boost city high streets and independent businesses. The cards can only be used in Scotland Loves Local businesses within the Glasgow boundary and almost 200 in the city are registered with the scheme. The council said it wanted to use the cash it has been given to help low-income families and businesses that have been hit by the lockdowns and pandemic restrictions. 
Susan Aitken, leader of the council, said in a report to councillors, by using the Scotland Loves Local gift card scheme, it will provide cash to individuals from low-income households by way of a gift card that can only be redeemed within the city boundary, providing the local business community with a much-needed cash injection over the next year. The cards will be given out to low-income households who receive a council tax reduction benefit. Councillor Aitken added, The Scotland Loves Local campaign is a national initiative designed to encourage those who live in Scotland to think local first and support their local high streets. The outbreak of coronavirus has caused significant challenges for towns and city centres, high streets and local businesses who have lost out on vital trade. The Scotland Loves Local Local Gift Card is an innovative way of keeping spend local for longer in every community and region across Scotland. The programme is designed so that these cards cannot be used out with the city boundary, ensuring the spend remains within Glasgow, benefiting local businesses. There are 84,566 households in the city in bands A to G who get council tax reduction. It will cost up to £9,300,000 to give them all £110 gift card, with the rest being spent on admin costs and postage. And the article was taken from the National News Desk. From the National, Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the Politics section, James Dornan, SNP MSP to take time off from Holyrood in Parliament, by multimedia journalist Angus Cochrane. SNP MSP James Dornan has announced he will be taking time away from Holyrood for health reasons. The Glasgow Cathcart representative says he has taken the decision following a recent spell in hospital. The MSP added that he will use the time away to recover physically and mentally as he reassured constituents his office would still be working as normal. Dornan said, Just recently I spent four nights in hospital and it gave me the opportunity to reflect on my health in a way I've not felt the need to for a long time. Having spoken with others, I have decided to abide by the evidence I've been given and take some time off work. During this period, I will recuperate and try to get my health, both physical and mental, back to a place where I can best serve my constituents once more. My office will, of course, still be working in casework and anyone who requires assistance should contact me in the usual manner. Thank you for your forbearance. And that was an article by Angus Cochrane. Ali McCoist fires hilarious contempt jibe at Neil Lennon after Cyprus move as Rangers hero offers congratulations by Aidan Smith. Ali McCoist has offered his congratulations to Neil Lennon after he was appointed head coach of Cypriot side Omonia Nicosia. The club, announced the former Northern Ireland international, has been handed a contract until the summer of 2024. The 50-year-old replaces former Rangers defender Henning Berg at Omonia, who were in the Europa Conference League group stage this season, but recently missed out on the Cypriots' top six when the league split in two. Lennon has been out of football since stepping down from his second spell as Celtic manager 12 months ago and Koisty was quick to send his well-wishes in his typical comical fashion. He said on Talk Sport, That gives us a problem and I'll tell you why. We need to find another body for the Six Asides on Friday. He went there and showed our Six Asides squad total contempt. He hasn't discussed his move to Cyprus with any of the boys and he's left us with 11 men. Neil, I clearly wish you all the best in Cyprus, but I want to know who's your replacement for the Six Asides. In all seriousness, magic. I'm really pleased for him. I spoke to him a good few times. I was of the opinion and I did say to him, get yourself out of the road. Take yourself somewhere away in Europe or America and go and enjoy yourself for a couple of years. I'm pleased that he's back in the game and I hope he gets the opportunity to do that. That article was by Aidan Smith. From The National, Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the sports section. Grumblings from the great and good in golf never cease. Nick Roger. I think I must be the only person on the planet, apart perhaps the village elder 
of the remote Huli Wigmen tribe of Papua New Guinea who has not played Blooming Wordle yet. Unless you're that village elder, you'll know that Wordle is a daily internet brain teaser which fiendishly invites you to guess a five-letter word in six attempts or fewer. In some ways, it's a bit like deciphering the haverings of the Tuesday column, which can be an addictively infuriating head-scratcher that just about requires the code-breaking gumption of the celebrated cryptanalysts at Bletchley Park. So, let's plough on with the weekly conundrum. Grumbling golfers get little sympathy. Given all the palaver with the Saudi Super League recently, it was almost refreshing to get back to some sort of normality at the weekend. And by normality, I mean professional golfers moaning and groaning. As the final day of the Arnold Palmer Invitational at Brutal Bay Hill unravelled, the background noise of wailing and whining was akin to the racket you'd get with an angle grinder performing an exorcism on a banshee. Thick rough, a boisterous breeze and baked greens led to the kind of additional battle that should have featured trenches and fixed bayonets. Rory McIlroy, who slithered out of contention over the weekend after opening with a 65, snapped a wedge in half and branded the whole thing crazy golf as he led the whinging. This is the same McIlroy who poured scorn on the Renaissance course at the Scottish Open a couple of years ago for being too easy. Scotty Scheffler, meanwhile, wasn't complaining as he kept his head while others lost theirs to win his second PGA Tour title in his last three events with a five-under tally. In an age when golfers at the top level have never had it so good, not many will have much sympathy for some of the pampered pontifications. Players were grousing and carping when we had a 34-under winning total on the Tour just a few weeks ago. Now they're grousing and carping when gritty pars are the order of the day and five under wins. Birdie fest or proper test? When it comes to course setup, you'll never please everybody. It's on to the Players' Championship at Sawgrass this week, where a whopping prize fund of $20 million will be on offer. There will, no doubt, be something to moan about, though. Ferguson gets lesson in School of Hard Knocks. No lead is ever really big enough, is it? Such is the nature of this fiercely fickle game. A commanding advantage can swiftly become as brittle as the Dead Sea Scrolls in the time it takes you to utter the words, the chasing pack is closing in. Winning at any level ain't easy. Bearsden's Ewan Ferguson had performed with wonderful aplomb to forge a four-shot lead heading into the final round on the magical Kenya Open at the weekend a maiden DP World Tour title, in just his 34th start on the main circuit, was in his grasp, and then it all went belly up. After closing with a 76 to fall back into a share of 8th, the 25-year-old admitted he found the pressure of leading hard to deal with. I didn't sleep much the night before just thinking about it. I couldn't believe I was leading by four shots, he said. In golf, it doesn't take much for the doubts to start swirling around in the mind. This correspondent's pessimistic outlook, for instance, tends to start the moment the dispenser at the driving range begins churning out a bucket full of 50 balls. Leading a main tour event was uncharted territory for Ferguson, and at this level of the professional game, any fragility will be ruthlessly exposed. It's an unforgiving business. The young Scot had three runners-up finishes on the second-tier Challenge Tour last year and has served a sturdy apprenticeship. His Kenyan disappointment will have been a sore one to stomach, but hopefully he won't dwell on it. In this school of extremely hard knocks, it's all part of the valuable learning process. Status quo rocking all over the world. You know I said winning ain't easy a few paragraphs ago. Well, forget that. With her victory in the LPGA Tour's HSBC Women's World Championship in Singapore, Ko Jin Young has now won six times in her last ten starts. This latest success arrived in her first event for three months, and the world's number one's figures are startling and record-busting. The 26-year-old from Korea has now posted 15 consecutive rounds in the 60s and 30 consecutive sub-par scores. 
In 2019, she went on a run of 114 holes without a bogey, which is in stark contrast to those of us who can nonchalantly reel off 100-odd holes without a sniff of a par. Her level of consistency in a game of capricious fortunes is quite staggering. With the women's major season looming, one can only wonder what she will achieve. The golfing gods don't dish out guarantees, but it seems every time Ko tees up, she contends. Sustaining such remarkable standards will be difficult, but as her hot streak goes on, let's just enjoy the ride. This article was by Nick Roger. From the National of Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the comment section, Maureen McGonagall. More must follow Australian Football League's lead against abuse. Hats off to the AFL, the Australian Football League, for taking a positive stance on body shaming when one of their players, Sarah Perkins, who was labelled as the league's first cult hero by ABC News, was targeted. The trolls were out in force, hiding behind their keyboards and commenting and on and criticising her appearance. Perkins called them out. But not everyone has the strength to do this, and they shouldn't have to. It's great the AFL is not just paying lip service and brushing complaints under the carpet. It has confirmed it will take action and suspend the club or league memberships of any social media troll they can identify who has been found to have abused a player online. This invisible bullying can be difficult to call out, but it can, and this is a good start. Such actions can and do have an impact on the mental health of anyone unfortunate enough to become a target for them. The hope now is that other sports, not just in Australia, take the same strong line, that together we can make a change and that those who are in charge of the platforms also take a more stringent view of this type of harassment and bullying. This action from the AFL came about following consultation with both male and female players in a review. All aspects, including disability, appearance and sexuality, and will be covered under the AFL's vilification rules. As we celebrate International Women's Day this week, it is sad to see that women in sport are still being judged on their appearance. What kind of message is this sending out to the young women who are keen to progress in their own particular sport? Be successful, but make a mistake and you will be vilified for all to see on social media. Hashtag Break the Bias is the theme for this year's International Women's Day and Scottish Women in Sport will celebrate this and help promote all the positive work that is being carried out in the name of sport. There is no doubt that rules such as those of the AFL used in sport help to change a long-established culture held within our society in general and help change the narrative and perception that women have to fit a certain stereotype in their looks, no matter their sporting or academic achievements. This article was by Maureen McGonagall. From The National, Tuesday the 8th of March 2022, from the sports section. Scotland versus Ukraine World Cup playoff postponed as fixture delayed until later in the year by Aidan Smith. Scotland's crucial World Cup playoff clash against Ukraine will be officially postponed later today. The match was due to take place on March the 24th But due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Football Association applied for the match to be called off. FIFA have informed the SFA that Ukraine will be unable to fulfil the fixture and it now looks set to take place in June. We told earlier this week how Shakhtar Donetsk director of football Dario Serna revealed that UEFA president Alexander Seferin confirmed the playoff would be delayed until June. 
Seferin personally intervened to allow many of Ukraine's international home-based players and foreign stars based in Ukraine safe passage to his home country of Slovenia. Srena, who was capped 34 times by Croatia, contacted Seferin for help in getting his players to safety. And he's revealed UEFA and FIFA have already decided to move Scotland's game back to June. He said, I spoke with UEFA president Alexander Seferin again today. He has stood up for Ukrainian football. I understand that no one cares about football now, but he told me that the match between Ukraine and Scotland will be postponed to June. In addition, there will be a special transfer window set up to allow players based in Ukraine a temporary transfer to allow them to get back playing football. I contacted him when war broke out to ask for help. He personally helped to organise a train to get the players out of the country. He promised he would help the players, and he has been as good as his word. That article was by Aidan Smith. You're listening to The National as published on Tuesday the 1st of March 2022. Comment. In Ukraine, the cheapest surrogacy has a high human price. By Shona Craven, columnist and community editor. A more gut-wrenching depiction of vulnerability would be hard to find. A dozen premature babies, hastily evacuated from a neonatal ward in Ukraine, lying in an improvised bomb shelter. Medical staff are holding and rocking some of the babies. Others lie on makeshift beds, swaddled in blankets. It doesn't look real. Elsewhere in Ukraine, at least two babies have been born underground in recent days one in a subway station in Kiev, as her mother sheltered from Russian bombardment, and the other a boy in the basement of her hospital in the eastern region of Luhansk. No one reading about these women's experiences could fail to feel extreme sympathy for their awful plight and relief that they and their babies survived, at least for now. However, other recent births in Ukraine have been covered very differently in news reports, Since the Russian invasion, a wave of stories have focused on would-be parents from other countries who have paid women in Ukraine to carry babies for them via surrogacy. Some have found themselves stranded in Ukraine with newborns at the worst possible moment, unable to reach an embassy to collect emergency travel documents, while others face an agonising decision. They can follow government advice and refrain from travelling to the country with unknown consequences for the babies or defy that advice and go to Ukraine, not knowing how or when they will be able to return. Scant mention is made in those stories of the women who actually gave birth to those babies and who are presumably also trapped in Ukraine given their physical condition and the fact they will have children of their own to look after, having already given birth to healthy offspring being a prerequisite for becoming a surrogate mother. However, it is unsurprising that their circumstances are not reported, since the couples who enlisted their services via third parties likely never interacted with them directly, do not share a common language with them, and will probably never learn their fates. Surrogate mothers are still given that title in Ukraine, which in the space of just two decades has become one of the world's most popular destinations for seeking them. In the UK we tend to hear about surrogates, an adjective made into a noun, while in the US the even more dehumanising gestational carrier is increasingly used to indicate that the woman experiencing the pregnancy has no genetic relationship to the child, that she is not its mother. Legal relationships are more complex and one of the reasons Ukraine has become so popular for surrogacy is that the genetic or intended parents are also the legal parents from the moment of the birth. The other, related reason for its popularity is the price. Clients can sign up for an all-inclusive deal as if booking a package holiday. Websites make preposterous promises, such as offering a guaranteed baby programme. Surely only someone whose reasoning is clouded by desperation could avoid drawing grim conclusions about the standard of care that would be provided if a pregnancy didn't go to plan. The cheapest surrogacy in Europe is in Ukraine, the poorest European country. No wonder it involves numerous intermediaries and various misdemeanours, as well as any other business in Ukraine. 
This quote isn't from a politician, campaign group or human rights organisation. Incredibly, it's from the website of the Biotexcom Centre for Human Reproduction, a major player in the surrogacy market in Ukraine. Its owner, Albert Totchilovsky, is frank about the fact that he has been accused of trafficking thousands of Ukrainian babies abroad and boasts that the sum paid to women from villages whose salaries are a pittance and often have no men to support them is a huge amount of money for rural residents. In 2018, El País reported that Totchilovsky claimed to control 70% of the market in Ukraine. The industry is unregulated and there are no official figures, but a report by Al Jazeera published in the same year under the heading Ukraine's Baby Factories, the Human Cost of Surrogacy, cited a Kiev-based lawyer who estimated there were 2,000 to 2,500 surrogate births in Ukraine every year, with almost half through Biotexcom. He also said that two-thirds of the industry operated illegally. The report went on to allege poor housing and medical care of surrogate mothers, with one woman saying she was forced to share a small apartment with four other women 32 weeks into her pregnancy, even sharing a bed with one of them, then ended up in intensive care following poor standards of care in the hospital where she gave birth. Spare a thought for these poor, desperate women in Ukraine, currently carrying babies who may never be collected, whose chances of decent postnatal care plummeted when the bombs began to fall, and whose nightmares may be only just beginning. This article was by Shona Craven. The National News on Wednesday the 9th of March. Ernest Shackleton's lost ship found in Antarctica. An article written by Angus Cochran, multimedia journalist. The wreck of Sir Ernest Shackleton's ship Endurance has been found off the coast of Antarctica. The wooden ship had not been seen since it went down in the Weddell Sea in 1915, and in February the Endurance 22 expedition set off from Cape Town in South Africa a month after the 100th anniversary of Shackleton's death on a mission to locate it. The Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust said Endurance was found at a depth of 3,008 metres and approximately four miles south of the position originally recorded by the ship's captain, Frank Worsley. The expedition's director of exploration said footage of Endurance showed it to be intact and by far the finest wooden shipwreck he's seen. Menson Bound said, We are overwhelmed by our good fortune in having located and captured images of Endurance. It's upright, well proud of the seabed, intact and in a brilliant state of preservation. You can even see Endurance arced across the stern, directly below the taffrail. This is a milestone in polar history. Dr John Shears, the expedition leader, said his team, which was accompanied by historian Dan Snow, had made polar history by completing what he called the world's most challenging shipwreck search. He explained, in addition, we've undertaken important scientific research in a part of the world that directly affects the global climate and environment. We've also conducted an unprecedented educational outreach programme with live broadcasting from on board allowing new generations from around the world to engage with Endurance 22 and become inspired by the amazing stories of polar exploration and what human beings can achieve and the obstacles they can overcome when they work together. Shackleton and his crew set out to achieve the first land crossing of Antarctica, but Endurance did not reach land and became trapped in dense pack ice, forcing the 28 men on board to eventually abandon ship. They were stuck in the ice for around 10 months, before escaping in lifeboats and on foot. Historian Dan Snow wrote on Twitter, Endurance has been found. Discovered at 3,000 metres on the 5th of March 2022, 100 years to the day since Shackleton was buried. After weeks of searching, Endurance was found within the search box conceived by Menson Bound, only just over four miles south of the location at which its captain Frank Worsley calculated it had sunk. The entire team aboard Endurance 22 are happy and a little exhausted. Nothing was touched on the wreck, nothing retrieved. It was surveyed using the latest tools and its position confirmed. It's protected by the Antarctic Treaty, nor did we wish to tamper with it. He said the wreck is coherent and in an astonishing state of preservation. An article written by Angus Cochran. The National News on Wednesday the 9th of March. 
man killed and two others injured after horror fall on Ben Nevis, an article issued by the National News Desk. A man has died and two others have been left injured after climbers got into difficulties on Ben Nevis. Two Coast Guard helicopters and a mountain rescue crew were called to the scene in the Scottish Highlands shortly after two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Police have confirmed that a 28-year-old man has died and two others, aged 29 and 37, were taken to hospital for their injuries. The Press and Journal has reported that the man who died fell nearly a 1,000 feet from Scotland's highest mountain, with an army group also involved in the rescues. A total of 17 people were rescued from the mountain. There are no suspicious circumstances surrounding the death and police have said that a report will be sent to the Procurator Fiscal. A Police Scotland spokesperson said around 2.15pm on Tuesday the 8th of March, police were made aware of concerns for a number of people in difficulty on Ben Nevis. Emergency services and mountain rescue colleagues attended to assist 17 people off the mountain. We can confirm that a 28-year-old man was pronounced dead at the scene, whilst a further two men, aged 29 and 37, were treated for minor injuries in hospital. There are no suspicious circumstances surrounding the death and a full report will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. A spokesperson for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency said, At approximately 2.30pm today, and at the request of Police Scotland, the Coast Guard sent the search and rescue helicopter from Inverness to assist Police Scotland, following a report of an incident involving a casualty requiring medical attention at Ben Nevis. Whilst on scene, the Inverness helicopter requested further support, leading to the Coast Guard helicopter from Prestwick also being sent to assist, along with mountain rescue teams who are helping in this ongoing multi-agency response. Lochaba Mountain Rescue Team described conditions on Ben Nevis at the beginning of the week as Alpine. An article issued by the National News Desk. The National News on Wednesday the 9th of March. Misogyny Act could be a game-changer in the battle against male violence. An article written by Abby Garton Crosby, multimedia political reporter. Scotland could lead the world by bringing in misogyny laws to tackle gender-based violence and harassment, and it would be a missed opportunity if the recommendations aren't taken up in full. The Misogyny, a Human Rights Issue report is comprehensive. It's drilled into the core of the issues facing women and girls in Scotland, and it gives the Scottish Government concrete actions to take forward. This isn't just platitudes on International Women's Day, this is a game-changer. As Baroness Helena Kennedy QC said as she launched the report at the Glasgow Women's Library on Tuesday, her suggestions are a package not to be cherry-picked. It seeks to address the insidiousness of misogyny and how far-ranging it is. It isn't going to stop locker-room banter, mother-in-law jokes or criminalised thought. Baroness Kennedy was explicit in setting out that the conduct stemming from misogyny is what will become an offence. But it gets to the crux of the problem. The justice system as it stands does not work for women and men need to be held accountable for their behaviour towards women. The most radical shift that the report suggests is the move away from law being neutral for both men and women, because that assumes that men and women are equal. Instead, the creation of three new offences, stirring up hatred against women and girls, public misogynistic harassment and issuing threats of rape, sexual assault or disfigurement, online or offline, will specifically target one of the biggest issues facing women in Scotland. This isn't criminalising wolf whistling or trying to chat someone up at a bus stop. It's when those actions become violent or intimidating, most of the time after the man has been rejected. Threatening women with sexual violence online would also provide protections. You just have to look at the lived experience survey analysis which informed the report. 63.5% of the 930 respondents said that they'd experienced misogyny in the street, but that's not the full picture. When the same question was applied to online and social media, the figure jumps to 72.8%. These offences would also allow the police to be able to record the scale of this type of behaviour in Scotland, something that's never been done before. With social media more ingrained in our lives than ever before, it's imperative that we do what we can now to stop the next generation of Scottish women and girls from facing abuse, misogyny and hatred as part of their daily lives. We know that misogyny is prevalent in our society, but if women don't trust the system, the police or the courts, then they won't come forward. Baroness Kennedy's suggestions, if brought in in full, would be a significant step in the right direction. 
it would change the lives of so many women and girls and go a long way in starting to build back that trust in the system. It certainly has the backing of the SNP. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon gave the plan her approval and said the contents would be considered carefully as she opened a debate in Holyrood on International Women's Day. Justice Secretary Keith Brown made similar comments. The Lib Dems have said the report should be a watershed moment, so it's likely that they will support it. The Scottish Tories have said they back the principles behind the vast majority of Baroness Kennedy's recommendations, but did not expand on which principles they didn't support. The Scottish Greens and Scottish Labour did not respond to our request, asking if they supported the report's recommendations. So, on the balance of probabilities, it's likely, but only time will tell. An article written by Abby Garton Crosby. The National Politics on Wednesday the 9th of March. Scottish independence could shatter patriotic alternative, extremism experts say. An article written by Hamish Morrison, political reporter. Scotland faces the threat of a far-right splinter group forming, according to the UK's largest annual review of the far-right. Hope Not Hate's State of Hate 2022 report, Britain's most comprehensive guide to far-right extremism, has found hate groups in rude health and organising in ways not seen for several years. Opposition to Covid lockdowns and accompanying conspiracy theories about the origins of the virus, as well as the fallout from Brexit and an erosion of political trust, have provided a fertile ground for extremist groups and ideologies, the report found. It identified Patriotic Alternative, or PA, as the dominant force in UK fascist politics and warned it could splinter into an independent group in Scotland due to the power of its branch north of the border. The report described the Scottish branch as PA's most active, hardline and independent. Scottish PA made the headlines last year after unfurling a White Lives Matter banner at the summit of Ben Nevis, and by launching a petition to name a new motorway bridge in Glasgow after Chris Donald, a white teenager who was killed in 2004 by a gang of men of Pakistani heritage. But Gregory Davis, a researcher at Hope Not Hate, said PA's official neutrality on Scottish independence was a particularly tricky obstacle for the branch to overcome. He added, Any future referendum is sure to split the group's loyalties. The Scottish branch of Patriotic Alternative is the most active within the national organisation. While still drawing only an extreme fringe of far-right members, the group is able to turn out activists for flyering and publicity stunts across Scotland and participates in activities ranging from group fitness sessions to handing out leaflets at anti-vaccine demonstrations. The success of the branch and autonomy is a source of tension within PA, and its Scottish chief, Kenny Smith, is reputedly in a long-term feud with the PA's overall leader, Mark Collett, and is persistently rumoured to be plotting against him. Covid and the UK's loose anti-lockdown and anti-vaccine movements have also proven useful to PA, the report found. Simon Crane, who's also known as Cy Borg, is quoted in the report saying PA activists generally get quite a good reception, adding, I think we all thought they'd be rich pickings in the anti-lockdown groups. There's been a few guys come over, but probably not as many as we'd thought. Exclusive polling for the report paints a grim picture of the UK's political landscape, with around 74% of Brits saying they feel politicians do not listen to them. Hope Not Hate says a cost-of-living crisis and a proliferation of hostile rhetoric around immigration and asylum have created an increasingly welcome environment for authoritarianism and populism. The report also found that physical fitness and well-being classes were proving a useful vehicle for the far right to promote its ideology. PA has a number of ties to fascist British fitness groups, the report found. The organisation's CEO, Nick Lowe, said... After years in the political wilderness, the crises we've collectively faced over the past two years have emboldened cynical far-right activists to exploit our fears and uncertainties and return to traditional methods of campaigning. In 2021, we saw far-right activists marching on our streets, leafleting, and now they're preparing to stand in local elections. What we're looking at is a country that's moved on from Brexit, which marginalised the British far-right and the fallout from an erosion of political trust. He added, we're particularly worried about the growing numbers of young people being attracted to far-right politics and dangerous conspiracy theories. This trend has been happening for several years, 
but it's been accelerated by COVID conspiracies and the increasingly aggressive anti-lockdown movement. The threat is real, the far-right is stirring again, but there's still hope. By refusing to accept blatant far-right rhetoric and conspiracy theories as part of a normal discourse, we can prevent fascists and extremists from dividing our society. An article written by Hamish Morrison. The National News on Wednesday the 9th of March. Scottish woman, longest surviving recipient of artificial heart valve. An article written by Gregor Young, journalist. A woman who has become a Guinness World Record holder as the longest surviving recipient of a single artificial heart valve replacement has told how she feels incredibly lucky. Anne Bell, who's 77, underwent surgery to replace her mitral heart valve almost 50 years ago in December 1972. The mother of two was one of three people who underwent the operation at the time at the former Mayanskirk Hospital in Glasgow, which had a cardiothoracic unit. One patient survived for only a few weeks after surgery, while the other died a year afterwards. Miss Bell, who was 28 years old when she had the valve replacement, said, I was one of three people in hospital at that time who underwent this operation, and out of the three, I'm the only one who survived. She added, I feel incredibly lucky to have lived for such a long time after this operation. It's given me the opportunity to see both my children grow up and spend time with my husband and the rest of our friends and family. This new world record is testament to the outstanding care and treatment I've received, not only from the medical team who carried out the operation, but also the local doctors and nurses in NHS Fourth Valley who carry out regular health checks to make sure the replacement heart valve continues to do its job. Ms Bell was discharged from hospital just 19 days after she underwent the pioneering operation, although she recalled how her husband Jim made daily four-hour round trips involving two buses to visit her while she was there. Ms Bell's daughter, Carol, a former nurse, told how watching a television documentary on a disaster five decades ago had started the family wondering the length of time that patients usually live after a valve replacement. She said, we were watching a television programme about the 50th anniversary of the Ibrox disaster and it got us thinking about how it must be nearly as long since mum had her heart valve replacement surgery and whether this was unusual. She added that as her younger brother George had always received the Guinness Book of World Records as a Christmas present, the family had thought it would be interesting to see what the current record was for this type of surgery. Ms Bell said, We started researching it around six months ago and found that the previous record was 47 years after surgery. However, it's quite a long process to get a new record confirmed as they require a lot of detailed information and evidence to support it. The family's research, supported by clinical information and testimonies, confirmed Ms Bell has set a new record of 49 years and 60 days, with the family receiving a framed certificate when this was confirmed last month. An article written by Gregor Young. Reported from the National on the 9th of March 2022, from the Culture section, Back to School Age 30, You've Got to Hand It to Brandon, by Roxanne Surishin. Returning to academic studies as a mature student is no longer unusual. Colleges and universities welcome older people with open arms, as do the students who are in a more conventional academic journey. I know this because I returned to university myself three years ago. I admit I was apprehensive. When I attended for interview, I was a little unnerved when I found that my vetting session comprised me and five others young enough to be my children. But I needn't have worried. Our cohort of 30 was a happy blend of ages and we all got on brilliantly. I wasn't even the oldest student on the course. Brian McKinnon, however, took returning to academia to a whole new level. Under the guise of Brandon Lee, this Scot from Bear's Den returned to his former secondary school at the age of 30. A new film which premiered last week at the Glasgow Film Festival retells the story of him McKinnon claiming to be a 17-year-old from Canada, enrolled as a fifth-year student at Bears Den Academy near Glasgow in 1993 and gained five A-grade hires. It was a year later while he was a medical student at Dundee University that his double life was exposed by a newspaper and McKinnon was thrown off the course. The film My Old School was written and directed by John O'MacLeod, who was a 16-year-old classmate of McKinnon, or Brandon as he still calls him. McLeod told BBC Scotland that he does not think Brandon meant to do any harm and he has interviewed other classmates and teachers for the film who agree. A lot of people in the class have had their own take on what Brandon did, but for the most part they have a fondness for him, he said. I know that's not across the board. The film is not a takedown of him, but I don't agree with all the decisions that he made back then. 
McLeod explained that Brandon agreed to tell his story but didn't want to be seen on camera. So the 58-year-old present-day McKinnon is played by Alan Cumming, who lip-syncs to the words of the real-life interview. McKinnon has previously described how he left Bears Den Academy in 1980. He went on to Glasgow University but he was excluded after failing exams. McKinnon claimed that he had been unwell at the time but the university maintained the correct procedure had been followed. He said he was devastated when he was thrown out. I felt as if I'd been robbed and cheated out of my place at university, he told the Herald in 1995. In an interview with BBC Scotland soon after he was exposed, McKinnon told how he had enrolled at the school at the age of 30 by presenting two items of bogus documentation. These were a false letter from his father, who he claimed was a professor, and another from a tutor in Canada. He also claimed his mother was an opera singer who was touring the world and that he had returned to Glasgow, Scotland, to live with his ailing grandmother, and everyone bought this rather far-fetched story from a guy with the same name as an American movie star. Ten out of ten for effort, Brandon. That article was by Roxanne Surishan. The National, March 10. MSPs back economic crime bill to tackle Russian dirty money. Report by Abby Garton Crosby. MSPs have unanimously backed a bill to tackle dirty money in the UK amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Economic Crime, Transparency and Enforcement Bill was passed by the House of Commons on March 1 without opposition and is currently in the House of Lords. The legislation is part of a bid to tackle Russian interests in the UK and will establish a register of overseas entities which would require foreign owners of property in the UK to declare their true identity. Transparency International recently estimated that more than £1.5 billion worth of UK property was bought by Russians accused of corruption or with links to the Kremlin between 2016 and 2021, the majority of that property being in London. However, as the National previously revealed, there are numerous Russian-held properties in Scotland. Introducing the motion to give the bill legislative consent in Holyrood, Justice Secretary Keith Brown said that the Scottish Government and Parliament have unqualified support for Ukrainian sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity and the introduction of sanctions against Russia. He added, I feel the whole chamber will be united in supporting the actions we are taking to address the frequent violation of international law by Putin's regime. The people of Ukraine know that Scotland stands with them in the face of this unprovoked and unjustifiable aggression against their nation and they can be assured that we will take all possible steps to sever ties to Putin's regime and those individuals who support it. That is why I am seeking the agreement of Parliament in supporting the legislative consent motion on the Economic Crime Transparency, an important bill introduced into the UK Parliament on the 1st of March. Michael Mara Scottish Labour MSP for North East Scotland lodged an amendment to the motion which would add at the end but in so doing believes that the provisions of part one of the bill should apply to all land owned and registered in Scotland regardless of when this was acquired. Part one of the bill relates to the registration of overseas entities which would force property owners to reveal their true identity instead of using offshore firms to obscure who the real owner is. Mara told the Chamber, My amendment sets out that there should be no back date on assets which the Russian kleptocracy needs to declare here in Scotland. There is no logical sense as to why we must cut off at the 2014 date the land and assets they must declare. The people of this land have, I believe, a right to know 
who holds legal ownership of our common treasury, for which we are but stewards. SNP MSP Michelle Thompson hit out at the UK government during the debate, stating that the UK has been the hub for international organised crime for years. She added, Worse, it is not simply that we didn't have effective legislation. We've had multiple, particularly Tory governments, deliberately blocking reform. For example, despite the best efforts of some, and it is on the record, the UK government refused to tackle the criminality associated with Scottish limited partnerships and in doing so, in effect colludes with economic crime and corruption. Thompson also set out flaws in the Westminster Bill. She said, the legislation allows the UK Secretary of State to exempt individuals from having to register if it's thought to be for our own well-being. Perhaps this is a perk for pals of the Secretary of State, I don't know. Thompson added that she supported the motion but would reserve judgment on the success of the bill. Brown's motion and Mara's amendment both passed unanimously. Report by Abby Garton Crosby. Reported from the National on the 10th of March 2022 from the Culture Section. This Scottish town isn't even in the tourist guidebook, it really should be. By Robin McKelvey. Selkirk is not somewhere I usually even consider visiting. My guidebook on this borders trip doesn't even name check it. Within minutes of arriving, I realise that's a serious omission. Selkirk is not a place to miss. The town bursts with community spirit and independent shops. Then there's the William Wallace connections. A grand house being reborn and now soaring eagles. Oh, and Selkirk even have it, has its own gin distillery. That Silkirk is sometimes ignored today makes no sense even on a quick dip into its history. We're talking one of Scotland's oldest royal boroughs, a hub that sported Scotland's first racecourse and a grand abbey before Kelso, before Jedburgh, Dryborough and Melrose too. I start my trip at the site of Kirk of the Forest, where William Wallace was crowned Guardian of Scotland. A plaque marks the spot, but there really deserves to be a statue at this pivotal place in Scottish history. You can feel the heritage here and connect to the days when the vast Ettrick Forest stretched right across southern Scotland, ideal guerrilla warfare country. Selkirk boasts Bonnie Prince Charlie, Sir Walter Scott and James Hogg connections too. But what most impresses me is the modern day spirit of the suitors, as the locals are known. A name dating back to its famous cobblers. I find a real life suitor, Colin Turnbull, who welcomes me at Turnbull Shoe Repairs. We are carrying on the tradition that's been in Selkirk for centuries, he smiles. But it's not just us at the whole centre of Selkirk, Selkirk has loads of wee shops and businesses. He is right. I wander along finding a proper grocer and butcher, the kind I wish would open on my street. Selkirk is a glorious world away from supermarket homogeny. Selkirk's bed company is called Selkirk Means Business, and their slogan echoes what underpins their shops. Town Trade Tradition. I find facades beautifully revamped and green shoots everywhere. Signs of the work they and the community are doing. At the general store, I meet effervescent Sue Briggs, who bounces me around her brilliant shop. It could scarcely be more general. Recycling anything and everything, teaching people skills as they work. I snare a rugby ball cushion fashioned from tweed offcuts. Nothing goes to waste. I ask how badly the pandemic affected Selkirk, and I'm pleasantly surprised by the reply. We have more shops than before. People have been using the independent shops more and more. I find this positivity and creativity at Selkirk Distillers, Distillers too. This small batch operation concoct their delicious range of gins locally and have opened a small shop in the high street. The owner, Alan Walker, introduces me to one of the most unlikely gins I've ever tasted. It's flavoured with Selkirk Bannock. It's actually lovely, a warm hug of spirit that instantly evokes Christmas. There are gins distilled to raise money for charities close to Walker's heart too. Heart and passion ooze from Charlie Murray and Javier Ternero at Burnside Gallery in Frames 2. They've recently opened and chose Selkirk as there is a real sense of community here and we feel very welcome. Their own welcome is warm as I peruse a shop alive with art displayed in a beautiful space that looks more hipster cafe than dull gallery. Selkirk surprises every turn. The five turrets blow me away. 
This remarkable self-catering oasis in a grand old stone building offers more than great views out over the hills that lend Selkirk such a spectacular setting. Selkirk polymath Gethin Chamberlain is an accomplished photographer, foreign correspondent and wildlife conservationist. He's brought the best back from his travels. Bold colours, neat lines and solid hardwoods, creating a space a world away from Tartan Twee. Chamberlain is heavily involved in preserving wildlife and helping the community access it through Go Wild Scotland. So are the Golden Eagles, Eagle Centre, the Eyrie. Their innovative translocation programme has turned the tide after southern Scotland was at risk of no longer having a Golden Eagle population. It was just announced this month that their efforts have boosted numbers up to 33, the highest level in three centuries. You can learn more at the centre and also tuck into a lovely lunch in their bright new cafe. At my last stop, I'm met by an unlikely guide. Leader of Reform UK Scotland, Michelle Ballantyne may not be my political cup of tea, but she is putting a lot of energy into the community-focused fo- The Haining Project. This spectacular country house has presided over a wooded knoll in Selkirk since the 1790s. It's been resurrected by a charitable trust to function as a community space and events venue. They've already managed to build an accessible path around the lock the ho- house overlooks. Wandering the grounds, you'll find a touching bench dedicated to the frightened rabbit frontman Scott Hutchinson. That's one of the most talented, creative and more musicians Scotland has ever been blessed with, grew up in Selkirk, comes now as no surprise to me. I won't be ignoring Selkirk any longer. I suggest you don't either. www.exploreselkirk.co.uk www.scotlandstartshere.com That article was by Robin McKelvey. And that was this week's The National Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes with the publisher's kind permission. Thanks for listening.